You may be seated uh, this morning in the presence uh, of the Lord. Amen. Praise God for uh, all of you uh, this morning. Amen. Are we doing okay this morning? Amen. Not so much. Y'all don't sound too motivated. Amen. Amen. Maybe go army style. Maybe we just stand up in position of attention and do some side straddle hops or some flutter kicks or some, something army cool and get us fired up. I see some heads like, no, don't, don't do that. Amen. So we won't, we won't do any of that, but I'm so grateful uh, that we get the opportunity to magnify uh, the Lord's name together. The Bible says in, excuse me, the Bible says in Psalm 34 uh, that we are to magnify his name together and to exalt, exalt the us's, us, you and I, to exalt, uh, amen, his name uh, together. And I'm grateful that we've got four walls and a roof and a place that uh, we can come and worship the name of Jesus and uh, we don't have to stand outside in the heat. And it may be a little chilly, may be a little cold. That's okay. Amen. God has been so good to us. And I don't ever uh, want us to forget uh, how God, how good the Lord truly is. Amen. 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 We serve a good God. That never gets old. That never gets old. And when we begin to realize what we truly deserve... It puts the greatness of God in a different perspective. Amen. And I am so grateful uh, for the Lord and all uh, that he continues to do. I'm excited. Uh, and I really, really am. Let me tell you something. Uh, I want us to become, and this is not my message this morning, but I want us to become a people. And if we're not this person, I want us to become, and you're asking me, who, who should we become? Uh, that people that uh, learn to love the Lord, not because of what he does or what he can do, but that we could learn to just fall in love with Jesus just because of who he is. Amen. Amen. Let me tell you something. There are certain people that are in your lives uh, that come in your lives only because of what you do for them. I'm preaching already. And the moment that you stop doing the things that you did for them, they will disappear and the love will dry up. Stop doing what you do and they will leave your life. Because you're not producing and putting out how you used to put out and what you used to produce. And when you go back and you read uh, the third chapter of the book of Daniel, uh, I, I believe there's a group of men that understand biblically what it means to love God simply because of who he is. And when you go back to the third chapter of the book of Daniel, and the Bible says even in the very first verse that there is a king uh, by the name of Nebuchadnezzar and he builds... Uh, this big old statue and it's, it's full of gold and the Bible says that it measures 60 cubits in height and six cubits in width and he calls all the magistrates and the judges and the governors and all the leaders and he calls for almost a, 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 a induction a ceremony or a dedication service to dedicate uh, this statue that he wants to be worshipped and when he calls all the folks in, he says, listen, I'm going to play the lyre and the harp, and there's going to be uh, some special music that's going to be played in the land. And when you hear uh, the music play, I want you to make sure that everybody bows down and worships this God, that I, this golden God that I've created. And when you go back to the city, I want you to pay attention all of my leaders and if you find anybody who refuses to worship and to bow down to this statue then I want you to come back and report to me as the king because I'm going to throw them in the furnace and the Bible says in the third chapter of the book of Daniel that when the first uh, sound goes out uh, and that there's a particular judge in the city and uh, that there's uh, three gentlemen and y'all know the story about uh, the names of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego that for whatever reason, refused to bow down and worship uh, this particular God. And they run back uh, to King Nebuchadnezzar and they say, Nebuchadnezzar, there's these three uh, hard-headed boys that you put over in the province of Babylon and for whatever reason, they, don't, they won't worship and bow down that every time the music is played. And the Bible says that King Nebuchadnezzar, he, he had so much rage and so much anger in him that he, he summoned for these three boys to come before him. 
And the Bible says that when they were brought before him, Nebuchadnezzar asked them that, uh, why are you refusing to bow down? And, and, and their reply was, is that, well, we don't really need to give much excuse of why we're not going to worship uh, this golden God that you created, but just know that we're not. And then the Bible goes on and says that Nebuchadnezzar is so, so mad at this point. He's so enraged that he tells the soldiers to go to the furnace and turn it up seven times hotter than it was before. And the Bible says that Nebuchadnezzar says, come on, you, I'm, I'm going to give you one more chance. I know this morning you didn't have your Red Bull. You didn't have your, your energy boost. You didn't. I, it's not your morning. So maybe you just you look, you know, so come on and, and just bow down. Let's make this all easy for everybody so I don't have to make a public spectacle of you and burn you alive. And they said, listen, we, we, our God, uh, he can deliver us. In fact, he is known as the deliverer. But even if he doesn't deliver us, we will not bow down and worship him because of who he is. Did you hear what we said? Even though God may not do the deliverance, even though God may not do a thing, even though God may not show up, just because of who he is, we're not going to bow down and worship your golden God. And then the Bible says that, well, we know the story that the soldiers go up to the furnace and the fire is so hot that it even consumes the soldiers that go up and lead the three boys into the fire. And the Bible says that once they're standing in the fire, that King Nebuchadnezzar sits back and sees a fourth inside the fire. And Nebuchadnezzar, he's, a, he's astonished and he's, he's just so overtaken by, by the greatness of what's going on that he calls them, the Bible says, out the fire and their hair and their clothes are not even singed. And, and, and Nebuchadnezzar is, is so grateful that now he puts out a different decree in the land and he says, now from this point, we will now serve and worship the same God that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego worship. Because not only did God do a thing, but they had already made up in their hearts and in their mind that if God doesn't do it, that even though he doesn't do it, I've learned to love him simply because of who he is. Somebody ought to say amen. Hebrews chapter 5 this morning and I want to love the Lord for who he is and if you've been paying attention uh, just within the last four or five weeks uh, you will know uh, that if you listen to the words and some of the messages that God has put out and allowed uh, me uh, to speak in a time that we're living in and that a lot of these messages have been dealing with uh, end times and uh, dealing with the prophetic and dealing with uh, just some things uh, dealing with how to prepare and eschatology and the book of Revelation and Old Testament dealing uh, with the book of Isaiah. And I'm telling you, there are a lot of people that have reached out and have said, man, we are glad that you are dealing with. Uh, with what's going on right here in America. I've had people that have messaged the church. I've had people that have reached out uh, to me and have even uh, messaged me directly and even talked to me face to face and have said that and asked me questions like, when are we going to go deeper uh, into the book of Daniel? When are we going to dive a little bit deeper into the book of Revelation? I want to deal with the uh, the abomination of desolation and the Antichrist and the son of perdition and the war of Gog and Magog and where does the church sit when it comes to rapture and the second coming and I'm telling you as much as I feel and know uh, that the Holy Spirit is absolutely pushing us in that direction it almost seems like that every time we get close we're we're like right on the edge. We're, 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 we're literally on the cusp or uh, on the precipice of really pushing in uh, deep into, into really uh, taking a nosedive and a view into end times. And uh, it's almost like the Holy Spirit says there's still some things and some work that's undone. There's, there, there's still just a little bit 
that we've got to deal with before we go into the deep. And I know uh, folks want the higher and, and, and folks want to go deeper and, and folks want the secrets and the mysteries of God. But I promise you, I, and trust me, I, I want to go there and I, I want to teach through it and, and I want to preach through it because I know how beneficial it is to the American sanctuary. I know how beneficial it is to those who are waiting, who are, I mean, literally on the edge of their seats, wanting to know what God is saying uh, for the end times, for the direction of the bride of Christ and what we should be doing. And most importantly, as Peter preaches, uh, the person that we ought to be. But the thing, uh, and I promise you, is God is my witness. I, I, I don't want to talk about uh, really what, I, what we're going to talk about this morning in a very short amount of time. Uh, but, but we're going to deal with something this morning called uh, uh, spiritual maturity. And I know this is not popular. This is not, this is not what we want to deal with. And, and, and I know you're thinking, well, this ain't the message for me because I'm, I'm where I need to be. I'm already mature. I'm in a place spiritually where, where most aren't. This is the message. This brother, he ain't talking to me. He's talking to the person. Sim, you already in your mind or thinking of a person in your heart that uh, this, this message belongs to and you're exempt from it. And I'm here to tell you, uh, this is for everybody to include your pastor. And, 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 and maturity, let me tell you something, just to give us some, some real words of encouragement this morning, that, that, that being mature uh, spiritually has nothing to do with your age. In fact, if you ask me as a pastor, I, I've counseled teenagers, I, I've counseled adults, uh, young adults, and even mature adults, and I will tell you personally, and, and this isn't an insult to, to a certain age group, but some of the most spiritually immature people that I've ever dealt with were north of the age of 40. In fact, some of the most spiritually immature people I've ever had to pray with, pray over, and deal with biblically are in their 40s, 50s, and some even in their 60s. That, that, that spiritual maturity has absolutely nothing to do with how long you've walked with the Lord, uh, how many revivals you've been a part of, how many, uh, you know, what office that you serve in within your local church, how many times you attend Bible study, how many Sunday sermons that you've been a part of, uh, how, how long, you know, and, and I know the assumption is from a young person that this person we assume and there's, there's almost a, a preconceived notion or an expectation gap uh, because we expect certain individuals based on how long uh, they walk with the Lord and we say, well, They've been alive longer than I've been on the earth. They've been married uh, longer than I've been alive. They, 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 you know, they, they have, you know, children and, and they've got grandchildren and, and they own businesses and they're, they're bosses and they're directorates and they're, they're CEOs and CE, COOs and they, they are, they're the heads of this and it has nothing to do with anything. And then even on the opposite end of the spectrum, when we start talking about uh, what it means to be spiritually mature, if you are a young adult, if you are in that, in that crowd between 17 and 25, uh, on, the, on the opposite end of the spectrum, we uh, uh, somehow uh, begin to believe that spiritual maturity and, and growing up uh, biblically and having a knowledge of Jesus Christ uh, is based on uh, us entering into adulthood and being separated from the womb of parenthood. And the, young, and the young adults think that, well, my body's developing now and, and my voice is changing. I'm, I'm out in the, in the civilian population and I, and I, you know, I have a job now and I'm working and, and, and you know, I'm, I'm getting a little uh, fuzz on my chin now. And uh, as my grandmama could say, God rest her soul, you know, I'm smelling myself and, you know, I, I, I've got the hair going and it's starting to connect a little bit right up in here. And, you know, my pecs are developing and I'm, I'm posting pictures on social media and it's getting the attention of young females females now and you know I, 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 that I, I, I'm growing up and and young females are the same way and now I'm wearing makeup I, I've got a job now I've I've left mommy and daddy's house so I still may be there and I'm working my my you know my front's growing a little bit and my back's growing a little bit and and you know my my shoes used to be flat on the ground but now they're only flat for about two inches in the front and now they make a 30 to 40 to 45 degree incline with about two to four inches on the back and every time I walk around it makes Makes noise and it gets the attention of young men and people like uh, my pictures on social media so I've got to be growing up but the the, the sad thing about that uh, unfortunate reality is is that most of us on that end of the spectrum have bodies that have matured but minds that haven't caught up with the body and when you talk about what it means to mature by definition 
it's reaching definitively the most advanced stage within any process. And my granddaughter is, is seven years old. She can tell you, and she loves riding. I, I got a bench seat in my, in my pickup. And, and, you know, when I was younger, my grandpa would let me get in between him and grandma and ride in the middle, right where the, where, where the, the radio and stuff is. So now I put the bench seat down. She's here for the summer. And she says, Papa, I want to sit between you and Gigi. And I said, come on, baby, hop on in. And, you know, even at seven years old, she, she knows how to change the radio in Papa's truck and you know she can turn the volume uh, uh, up and down and she knows how to switch stations she knows how to fasten her seat belt she knows how to you know how to identify certain things in the vehicle but 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 just because that you know she's able to identify certain things within the vehicle she knows where the volume control is she knows where uh, where the radio and how to search through stations she knows the color of Papa's truck she knows where the seat belt locators are and where the buckles are doesn't mean that she's ready to get the keys in her hand to sit behind the steering wheel and actually operate Papa's pickup. And for some of us, as it pertains to the things of the Spirit, when it comes to the deep things of God and knowing the knowledge and the mysteries and the secret things of the Lord, you know, us sitting in church and being a part of uh, church things, and like I said last Sunday, even developing in our biblical language, uh, you know, mastering church colloquialisms and being able to speak and sound holy and portray holy and, and look like we know how to do the church thing, it, it may not be time quite yet for us to be able to handle the deep things and the mysteries and the secrets of Almighty God. Hebrews chapter 5. And I, I, I love Hebrews because it has almost a double weight to it because it just, you know, even though it is a, a New Testament epistle, within the New Testament, it speaks to, to two different audiences. It not only speaks to the a Gentile who has now been converted to Jesus Christ, but also speaks to the Jew who's been converted to Christ and the Jew who has the potential to be one to Christ. And I believe truly the Lord does want to take us to the higher. And truly the Lord wants us to go into the deep. And I know people are extremely frustrated with me oftentimes because I don't, you know, always say yes to everything and everything that, that, that shines and glitters and is a great opportunity. As a pastor, I don't always say yes to because I'm one who likes to take my time because I don't want to say yes to something that God hasn't given me uh, permission or the authority to say yes to and then to lead the people and to be the shepherd and to shepherd God's people in a direction or to move God's people in a direction to a specific thing that God hasn't given me permission to do so it would be immature on my part. And to get us to that place uh, this morning is, is I, I know it's going to be challenging, but it's absolutely of a necessity. And I'm reading this morning in Hebrews, uh, beginning in Hebrews chapter 5, and I won't be long. I promise, maybe. And um, Hebrews chapter 5, beginning at verse 5, uh, we're talking about, uh, here the author is talking about a forever priest. And a forever priest is Jesus Christ. And it says that, so also Christ did not glorify himself, get this, to become high priest. But it was he who said to him, listen to this, that you are my son and today I have begotten you. Uh, as he also says in another place, that you are a priest, uh, not temporarily or not every now and then, but that you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And I really love a, a lot of what goes on in Hebrews, and I'm excited and jumping up and down, and I don't drink coffee, I'm not high, I'm not intoxicated on alcohol this morning. I'm just excited because I know there's just so much in here in the word uh, that the Lord wants to speak. And I, and I know many of us, we, that, you know, the Melchizedek is such an, uh, a mysterious Old Testament figure. In fact, uh, the Bible really doesn't have much to say about him. And we see uh, Melchizedek mentioned in the 14th chapter of the book of Genesis and in Psalm 110. And we know that Melchizedek was an actual person. Uh, the Bible lets us know that he was a king in Salem or in Jerusalem, what we know today uh, as modern day Jerusalem and we know that there was a parallel uh, between biblically between Abraham uh, and Melchizedek and both were kings of righteousness and their priesthood it actually uh, superseded and was greater than the Levitical order 
And when we see this, we know uh, when we look at the one, the 110th Psalm, uh, that when it talks about uh, Melchizedek, that there's a messianic Psalm that King David writes about where Melchizedek is also seen as a type of Christ. And when we look at here in verse 7, it says that who in those days of his flesh, uh, talking about Jesus, when he had offered up prayers and supplications uh, with vehement cries and tears uh, to him who was able to save him from death, the Bible says, save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear. And a part of growing up in faith, a part of uh, allowing the Holy Spirit to uh, mature us spiritually and develop us uh, into the place where I believe the Lord uh, wants to take us is going to start with having a genuine fear for the Lord. And I'm not talking about, oh man, I'm really afraid of God because I know what he can do to me. Man, I'm afraid of God because I know the power that he possesses. Man, I'm afraid of God because I know uh, I committed a sin yesterday or even uh, thought about something sinful or even did something sinful this morning on the way to church. Man, I, I, I'm just uh, uh, afraid of, of the Lord. But th th this word, uh, uh, fear, in a original language in Greek is uh, eubala. And, and really what this word means is it talks about a, a respect. It's, it's, and it's not just a, a, a simple respect, but this uh, type of fear uh, that the author in Hebrews is referring to as we're talking about becoming spiritually mature is a deep respect for who God is. It's having a, a, a deep reverence uh, for the Lord. For, for, for my older uh, generation, it would be uh, Aretha uh, Franklin's version of R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Amen. And, and for, my, for my younger folks or, or my middle-aged folks, this would be uh, uh, your version of uh, put some respect on my name. And the Lord here uh, in the writer through, through the author of Hebrews is saying, put some respect on my name. I, 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 I am Jesus. I am the eternal priest. I am the chief cornerstone. Without me, this thing is, is really uh, of no good. I, I am the one that, that salvation is going to come through. I am the one that is going to be slain before the very foundation of the world. I'm the one that's going to be the great redeemer. I am the one who's going to be known as Emmanuel, the Lord God with you. I am the one that's going to send the Holy Spirit, not only to be the active and the alive agent in the earth that's going to provide direction and love and conviction and all of the other things and the ministries and, and sanctification and all the other great things that the Holy Spirit is going to do, but, 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 but I, I, I need my respect. And it's a deep respect. And a part of growing up is respect spiritually and honoring the Lord, again, not for just all of the great things that he can do, but understanding who he actually is. And a part of growing up in this thing called faith is beginning to realize who Jesus Christ really is. And I love verse 8. Because here he says that though uh, he was a son, and yet he learned, listen to this, even though he was the son who had a father, he was able to learn what it meant to be obedient. And one of the things that I'm trying to stress uh, uh, to my baby girl, uh, Sister Lauren, is that a part of growing up and starting out as a, as a young lady is that you got to obey Papa and Gigi. And even though you, you, you don't really, uh, uh, may, you don't necessarily might not uh, like what I say, but, but one of your greatest uh, benefits and one of the greatest uh, blessings for you is just being obedient to the things that I'm asking you to do. And when we talk about spiritual maturity, if you, if you want to know where you are, I, have we really, and don't raise your hand and don't speak out loud, this is between you and the Lord, but, but have we really been obeying the Lord as the way God has called us in such a time as this? Do we really pay God the attention and give him the deep respect and the reverence that he's asking us to give him on a daily basis? And then I like this because after it talks about the obedience by the things which he suffered, it says here in verse 9, and having been perfected.
having been perfected. And this isn't the suggestion that Jesus Christ was not perfect. No, that's a lie. Jesus Christ has always been perfect. In fact, he is the only one who is perfect. Even after you and I were gone, he will still be perfect. But what this is talking about is that Jesus successfully had carried out God's plans. And not only did he endure suffering, but he endured temptation. And because he can empathize with the creation, this is so good, because Jesus has actually experienced real temptation and genuine suffering, now Jesus stands between us and God, Brother Ernest, as the mediator who can stand and bring an amends to the relationship of righteousness that was destroyed through the first man known as Adam. Not one amen, praise God. So now I've got a mediator, because think about it, the relationship got jacked up in the beginning. Sin had entered into the world, and I know this is, this is rudimentary, this is basic, this is so uh, Sunday school, your granddaughter needs to hear this, but I don't. But let me tell you this morning, you need to be reminded, just like I need to be reminded, that we need a mediator. And the mediator is the high priest, the forever, the forever priest, who's known as Jesus Christ. Which means that every time I walk through a moment or a season of darkness or uncertainty or I struggle with making a decision or I'm not quite where I, I should be and where I ought to be and we're going to get to that in a moment. I, I, I can rely on Jesus and I can run to him because he understands uh, in, in, in every single way what temptation and what real suffering looks like. I'm not going to a God who's never suffered before. I'm not taking my problems to a Lord or to a God who doesn't understand my problem he I can go to him when I'm faced with certain temptations and with certain things that I don't think even my wife or my husband or my best friend can understand but I can take these things to Jesus because he's the mediator and he absolutely understands everything that I have to face then it says here and I love this he became the author of eternal salvation to all of them that who obey him and verse 10, called by God as a high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have much to say about, but it's hard, the Bible says, to explain, since you have become dull in hearing. Uh, another, another place to point to a lack of spiritual immaturity. And to be dull in he hearing, uh, when, you, when you hear that word uh, in its original language, it literally means to be sluggish. It, it, it's, it's you become lazy uh, almost it, it's 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 when you 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 heard the word of God but you're you're not really quick to uh, to accept that you you've grown even more lazy in the faith and because you've grown so lazy in your faith and you become so sluggish that even though you think in your mind and your heart right now that you are ready for the deeper, you're ready for the higher, you're ready uh, for the deeper things of Christ, you want the mysteries, you, you want the revelations, but because that you are dull of hearing and you become sluggish, even if I tried to explain the truth to you, it would be extremely difficult because you're dull and sluggish of hearing. Which means even though if we, if we decided to go through the deeper things or, or, or deal with some things within the word of God, if, if because I'm sluggish in hearing and I can explain it and we can exegetically walk through it, but, but if, you're, if you're hearing sluggish, it's difficult. And I love verse 12 because here the author says, for though by this time, and we see the word time which indicates that I've got to get to a place that the time chronologically where the author is writing and making reference to that we haven't arrived at that time. And that's why even as a pastor and as a shepherd, I am so, so in love and so dependent upon God's timing. Because if you know anything about the timing of the Lord, God never does anything in an untimely fashion. In fact, when God says a thing, decrees a thing, or even ordains a thing, it's with inside the confines of divine time. And here the author says that for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again 
the first principles of the oracles of God. And I told you in the beginning, I wish I had time to really walk through this. Uh, but if you go into chapter 6 in the book of Hebrews, where it talks about the perils of, of not being able to progress uh, along the lines of spiritual maturity, there are actually six things that the author brings to our attention that talks about the first principles or the fundamentals of just the oracles of who God is. It's faith towards God. We see baptism. We see laying on of hands, the resurrection of dead, and even repentance of dead works. And one of my favorites, eternal judgment. And these six things in chapter 6, the author brings out and calls them the oracles or the first principles of God. But here in the, in the text, in verse 12, he says that you ought to be in a position where you can teach these things, but instead you've arrived at a place where not only you need to be taught, but you need to be taught these things again. And I believe the question that the Holy Spirit wants to ask this morning is, are you and am I where I ought to be? <laughs> am I, am I, am I, have I grown into a place spiritually uh, when, it, when it pertains to maturity, am, am I in the place where God has called me to be? Am I, am, I, am I where I ought to be right here in June 2022? And, I, and I, don't, I don't believe the Holy Spirit is asking, am I attending the right church? And that may be a real question. Am I at the right place? Am I, is my family? Uh, but I, I'm talking about you personally within your walk, within the race of faith, spiritually. I'm not talking about natural maturity. I'm not talking about body development and a, and, a, and a month and a day and a year that's on a piece of paper called, called a birth certificate. No, but spiritually, are you at the place where you ought to be? Am, have I advanced, talking about maturity, have I advanced to the most advanced stage in the process of my faith in this race to become and be transformed into the image of Christ? Am I where I ought to be? Is there something that's happened to me even in my childhood that's been traumatic that's prevented me from being who I ought to be? What lie has somebody believed this morning from Satan's mouth, from the devil himself, that you believed that never came from the Holy Spirit that you grabbed a hold of and that you've ran with ever since you were a child that you've held on to that has caused you to be where you are not right now? Are you where you ought to be right now? Are you who you should be right now? Are you at the place where if God were to give you the mysteries and the deeds things of God and the revelations of God could you handle it are you at a place where you ought to be can the Lord trust you with the secret things of heaven this morning are you where you ought to be am I where I ought to be this morning what would happen how many lives could be saved if I could just simply be who I ought to be how many people potentially, Brother Dante, could I lead to Jesus Christ if I could simply be who I ought to be? How many people could I be an effective witness to if I could simply be who I ought to be? <laughs> How many marriages, oh my God, we're going to get down a little bit. What, what would happen if I could be who I ought to be? Am I the person that I ought to be this morning? Spiritual maturity. Or do I need to, to go back again and to be taught the, the oracles and the, the first things of God? To, uh, are there cracks in my foundation? Can I go any higher? Can God build any higher than he's already begun to build? Because if you know anything about building, without a good structure, we get in trouble the higher that we attempt to go. Am I where I ought to be this morning? Am I ought to be? Am I, am, am, where am I? Am I where I should be this morning? Where should I ought to be? Listen to this. <laughs> you have come to need milk and not solid food. 
For everyone who partakes, listen to this, only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. And I can tell you, because I, I, I've, I've drank milk all my life, and you know, my wife and all, they, it was gross, I don't know how you can, like I can still go to the refrigerator today and pour a glass of milk just like it's a nice uh, glass of water and, and drink it. I've been doing it ever since I was a little boy. Even growing up, I would eat spaghetti and I would have a cup of milk, a glass of milk. And he's like, ooh, that's gross. And, you know, but that, that's just how I grew up. And listen, I, 20, almost 21 years in the Army, look, i never broken a bone. And, I, I, you know, listen, I would, I would contribute it to milk. I could be a spokesperson for milk. milk. I can testify that milk genuinely does a body good. Like, I, I get it. I get it. And I believe God gets it. But there comes a time when we start talking about spiritual development and spiritual maturity that milk will only be good for a little while. That in fact, when we start, even when we look into the life of a child, of a natural baby, after a while, the milk and being breastfed, it, 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 it has its place. But if you've ever had little children, there's going to come a season where when the bottle comes up or when the other thing is, it, it, uh, I don't want none of that. Right, like I, I want you eating Publix chicken. I want Publix chicken. <laughs> the stuff that's in your plate, I want too. The milk, that's cool. I'll use milk to wash down the solid food, but milk just as an entire meal. Look at what the word says. That you that that, that listen to this is so good that you're unskilled in the word of righteousness. That this is indicative of you being unskilled. In the word of right living, of right relationship, of the righteousness that, ex that should exist between you and God. And then the word says, for you, for this person, male or female, you are considered to be a babe or a baby. Then it goes on to say in verse 14, and you can come on up worship. Then it says right here in verse 14, but solid food belongs to those, get this, who are full of age. Solid food, talking about the word of righteousness, belongs to those who are full of age. Again, talking about the word. So there are times where we think that we are ready for God to say and to speak a certain thing on us and in our lives, but it may be honestly a time of spiritual immaturity where we're not quite ready to receive what we want God to give us. And here it says that you have to become full of age. And this word in the original language is talking about practice and it's talking about habit. It means that I've got to not only be skilled to the point of knowing or hearing the word of righteousness or right living, but I've got to make the word of righteousness a practical habit in my day-to-day -day living. That means it's not good enough just to hear the word of God, but I've got to hear the word and I've got to practice the word. Oh, it's getting good. I've got to hear the word of God on one end of the spectrum and then I've got to practice the thing that I hear because for me to hear the word of God on one end and not to allow the Holy Spirit to teach me how to not only know what I'm hearing is right and from God but now Holy Spirit I need your power and your spiritual ability to mature me to be able to flip the switch inside of my heart and in my mind to put your word to practice how many don't answer this how many marriages could be saved if we would practice the word that we hear every Sunday morning? Pew Research. I, I gave you, I dropped some numbers on your last Sunday. I'm going to drop some more on you. I'm going to drop just one on you this morning. I'm a numbers guy. But Pew Research, which is a Christian analytical development team, I call them bean counters. But they said as of March of this year, 2022, that now Christian divorce has, has risen out of 69%. And now that it competes with, with the secular world. And I think about this morning, even in my spirit, how many marriages would be saved if we could practice the word of God? If wives could practice what it means to 
submit to their husbands because they submit to Christ. And husbands, as Paul uh, teaches, that we can love our wives as Jesus loved the church to the point that he gave his life for it and he died for the bride of Christ. What would happen in the American sanctuaries if we could simply practice what we hear? How many people could develop and, and, and hit an advanced stage of supernatural maturity if we could begin to make a habit of hearing the word of God? Because if you ask me, and it's just if you ask me, but just in my biblical opinion, I believe that is one of the greatest major disconnects within the bride of Christ is that we will have hundreds, if not tens, if not hundreds of thousands of men and women, black, white, orange, purple, polka dot, striped, tall, wide, short, that will sit, on a, sit up under God's word and the word of God being rightfully divided Sunday, week in and week out, but will leave the doors of the church and cut this video off on YouTube or Facebook when Whatever platform that you're watching on, you will hear the word of God, but you will never allow the spirit of God to turn that thing off called flesh and turn that person on called the spirit to be able to put in practice and habit what you heard on Sunday morning. That the enemy, listen to this, and I heard this in my prayer, even getting in the truck and coming over to the school this morning, but one of the greatest attacks from the enemy is Satan is looking for Christians who hear God's word but refuse to put into habit and to practice what they hear. Y'all ain't listening to me, but that's okay. That's who he's looking for. He don't mind, let me tell you something, he don't mind that you pack the church out. He don't mind that you sit, on, sit up under good worship and you hear good music. He doesn't mind when you sit under, under good preaching and good teaching. He doesn't care. But the moment that you remove sluggishness and remove the dull ear and begin to actually put into practice what you heard in this gym this morning, that's when you become a threat. That's when you become a target. That's when you get, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm living it right now. This is when you paint the bullseye on your back. And this isn't to scare you. This is to give you confidence, to give you, super, to give you spiritual motivation and boldness this morning. To know that the Bible has already decreed that greater, talking about the Holy Spirit, greater is he that lives inside of you than that old devil that lives in the world. Knowing that you don't have to leave this gym and cut this video off and be afraid to die and be fearful. That if we begin to put this thing into practice, I, I told you, I gave you some very alarming statistics last week, but how many of our children and, and grandchildren could come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ if we could practice the word, which is to raise them up in the admonition of the Lord Jesus, that even if they defect and decide to divert and, and go about their own way, that because of the word that we as godly parents and as godly grandparents have planted inside of our children, our grandchildren, that God has made a promise that even if, even if they, they divert or defect from the faith, that God is a promise keeper and he'll bring them back. But we got to practice the word. We got to practice the word. And it says here, who are full of age, that is, who by this reason have used their senses exercise to discern both good and evil. And I like Peter. I'm going to be quiet after this, but I, I, I mm. second Peter, you don't got to turn there. I'm going to read it real quick. And if anybody knew about what it meant to be spiritually mature, it was Peter. And Peter says in second Peter chapter three. In verse 17 and 18, you therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, time, talking about time again, divine time, you therefore, beloved, talking about the church, the saved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you fall from your own steadfastness, which means you can be steadfast and there's a season where it feels like you're on cloud nine. You can see things and you're so deep and you prophesy and the Holy Spirit falls on you and you speak in tongues and you lay on hands, you interpret tongue, you just watch out. But the Apostle Peter says also watch out because just as easy as it is for you to walk in steadfastness, you can fall away from being steadfast. And being led away, listen to this, with the error of wicked. 
And that's the blessed thing about maturity, Brother Don. It doesn't mean, it doesn't have to do with how holy you are. Because even holy people make mistakes. Me. I'm not, I haven't made all the right decisions. I don't say all the right things. I don't cross every T and dot every I because I preach the gospel and stand up here every Sunday morning. I'm striving for the narrow road that Jesus talks about just like you are. I will stand before judgment even with a greater amount of judgment just like you. We make mistakes. Yeah, I, I, I've probably made some partnerships and got into some relationships that, that, that I thought God said yes to, but it was really me that thought it was God. That, I, that, I've, that I've made decisions and, and thought I should have got married to this young lady and I, I put God's name on it but, it, but it failed and it fell through the cracks and I thought it was God and I dated this person that I thought it was and I thought it was a vision from God but it, I just had heartburn from McDonald's and a bad dream. It, 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 it wasn't what I thought it was. <laughs> Steadfastness to now being diverted from error. But listen to verse 18. Peter says, I need you to grow, grow in grace. And two things he says grow in, and that's grace and the knowledge of God. And the reason that I believe Jesus says to grow in these two areas, and I'm almost done, but to grow in grace and knowledge is because to grow in anything else is senseless. But not only growing in the grace of knowledge, it really uh, uh, propels you into real spiritual maturity, but think about it. The grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ are innumerable. They're infinite. Which means I can go back to them as much as I need, and as much as I want to, and there will always be something new through the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ for him to give me so I can grow and be who I ought to be. So instead of running to, to, to everybody else for advice and uh, let me find out what this person did and what this person said and, and, and Dr. Phil and Oprah Winfrey and da 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 No, no, no. Let's run to the word of God because in him is knowledge and grace. And in his grace and knowledge, it won't be a bad dream and heartburn. It'll be the words and the voice of God telling me to do a thing and to get into partnership and to sign the contract and to say yes to this person and to move in this direction and to cut this person off and to say yes over here and say no over here and to worship right now and to go to war over here, to love over here and to love even over here. We need God. And a part of growing up, and a part of allowing the Holy Spirit to mature us is allowing him to advance us. And in the advancement, oftentimes, it's extremely uncomfortable. But I'm telling you, it is in the times of uncomfort that it forces us to trust in Jesus Christ. And I know that as a pastor. A lot of times I'm uncertain. And I know I, I, I present strong and bold and courageous. And I believe that I'm all those things only in Christ Jesus. but I trust in him. I'm in a place now where I depend on the presence of God. It used to be when I was a babe in Christ, I didn't mind that the presence of the Lord fell on me on Sunday morning. Now I'm not satisfied unless Christ lead and his presence fall upon me. I won't leave my prayer room until God speaks and sometimes it's me just shutting my mouth and listening for the voice of God. I'm not satisfied. Or you ought to be where you ought to be this morning. And if you're not, let the Holy Spirit show you who you ought to be and place you where you ought to be.